When we step on the gas in a car, what happens? Well, okay, if you set the gear to parking, nothing happens except the engine uh, gets louder and consumes more fuel. But if we're actually driving the car on the roads, we step on the gas and the car speeds up. Whether forward or in reverse if we're backing up. Now, what do we call this? Oh, we usually call it, oh, the car accelerated. What happens when we step on the brake? Oh, the car decelerated. Um, for physics purposes, both of these are acceleration. So, I st start at a stop, and then I gain speed, and I gain more speed, and, well, I accelerated forward in that case. Now, what happens if I'm moving along, and then I come to a stop? How has my velocity changed? Well, my velocity was initially going forward, and then, well, it decreased until the velocity reached zero. That is acceleration backwards. Why is it acceleration backwards? Well, acceleration backwards increases the magnitude of the velocity backwards. But if you're initially going forwards, that's a negative amount backwards. So to go from a negative amount to zero meters per second backwards, you need to increase it backwards. So add numbers to get from negative to zero. Now acceleration is just defined as the rate of change of velocity, so how quickly an object's velocity changes over time. Now acceleration can be felt whenever something is picking up speed and we are sitting inside it. Why is this? Well, our inertia, we tend to not move. This is a law of motion that we will cover later. So that's why these astronauts have to sit with their backs downward. Because the human body is capable of withstanding more acceleration from back to front than in any other direction. Okay, front to back is not so bad. But, up or down, the human body is not very good, to say the least. So, this space shuttle, which is a retired system, well, during liftoff, it has to accelerate because it starts at a stop. And how does it get to orbital velocities, or orbital speeds? It needs to speed up. And, well, eventually, after it inserts into orbit, it coasts. And so it just relies on its existing speed to keep it in orbit. The velocity is enough that the gravitational pull of the Earth is exactly balanced to keep it in orbit. Okay. Um, wait a second. The atmosphere doesn't just, oh, you reach a certain height and then like there's a random force field. No, the atmosphere still exists to some degree up here. Therefore, there is some acceleration on satellites and other orbiting bodies besides the acceleration of gravity. And that is why orbits will tend to decay. Now the moon, well, that's a different story. There are tidal forces involved. And the net result is that the moon is getting farther and farther away due to transfer of energy. But that is really complicated. So for satellites, there is some amount of drag. This air resistance uh, is very small for satellites, so it can take very, very many years before the fragments come back to Earth. But it is large enough, as the air gets denser, for the re-entry to significantly heat up the heat shields or other heat dispersion systems of spacecraft during re-entry. And if they don't have a heat shield, they tend to just burn up. Now to deorbit, the shuttle must accelerate 
in the opposite direction to its current heading. So from its current velocity. And this reduces its velocity so that it can go through re-entry and land. Now, when landing, it uh, has parachutes, which are another way of accelerating backwards by use of air resistance. Now, when we deal with kinematics in high school physics, we almost always ignore air resistance because while air resistance is not very large compared to the masses and the inertia, momentum, kinetic energy, and so on, of most objects that we use. Because all well, the velocity it's going forward at is quite small. Now, yes, you can feel the air resistance, but I'm pretty sure that our arms, for example, or other things that we use in common high school physics experiments, are heavy enough uh, that they just keep going at least for the duration of our relatively short experiment. Of course, if you're launching an object something like 300 meters uh, for an experiment, um, yeah, you're probably going to have to calculate for air resistance and probably do it by trial and error method, i.e. test firing the device. But uh, practically speaking, for most of our questions, we just ignore air resistance, unless very specifically otherwise stated. Now, acceleration can be determined from a velocity time graph. This describes the motion of an object. The velocity is on the vertical axis, and the time is on the horizontal axis. Very often, um, even teachers will not bother to put the little arrow to indicate that it's a vector because well they're telling you that this is one dimensional and if you're saying it's a velocity time graph then we're dealing with if there's no specific direction the positive negative dimension yes okay this is annoying because it often isn't that well distinguished from a speed time graph but there's a reason why we don't generally use speed time graphs in physics class. Uh, technically speaking, it is also true that if you don't put a direction, you don't necessarily need the arrow. Even though we know that we're treating this as positive and negative velocity. Now what happens when we uh, consider position time? Well, there's a change in position, so there's a rise, and let's use here. So there's going to be a rise, and there's a run. So something happened over some amount of time. Okay, so what happens when we're dealing with Velocity instead. Oh, the velocity went from 0 meters per second to 80 meters per second in how long? 8 seconds. And we see that this is a straight line, so technically we could use a smaller unit like this. Uh, but the point remains that this gives us 10 meters per second. divided by 8 seconds and this is delta V over delta T which is equal to acceleration and this gives us 10 meters per second squared now what happens if we graph the acceleration? Well, we end up with this. Meters per second squared time. Whether or not to put on an arrow on there is dependent on the teacher and also on the specific requirements of the question. I, is there an actual direction stated? If not, well, positive negative axis, you 
may not need to put the arrow. So here, this is 10. Wait, it's 10 all through. Does this make sense? We know that the acceleration is the rate at which the velocity changes. So for the first second, we go from 0 to 10 meters per second in a straight line. That's 10 meters per second per second. For the second second, we get from 1 to 2. And that's 1 second. And we go from 10 meters per second to 20 meters per second. Once again, it's 10 meters per second squared. So this straight line for velocity over time gives us a straight line for acceleration over time. Specifically, it gives us a constant value of acceleration, so it's a flat line. Now here we have the equations. So the rise is the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Either of these could be negative. For example, uh, say we go from negative 50 meters per second in a direction to negative 20 meters per second in a direction. Well, then we would have negative 20 minus negative 50, which is equal to negative 20 plus 50. And that's 30. Does that make sense? We changed by plus 30. And that's over final time minus initial time. We don't necessarily start our measurements at time zero. After all, if we look at our clocks, very rarely do scientists just decide, oh, we absolutely have to start this experiment at midnight on a particular day. No. So uh, if we look at our clocks, we end up with from 0 0.01 minutes into the experiment, something started happening. And then, well, we ended it at 2.35 or something minutes. Does that make sense? Well, not really. When you do experiments, you should try to use SI units, which means seconds, pretty much. Not hours, minutes, and so on. Uh, yes, you can record your initial numbers in hours and minutes and so on, but you should always convert them to seconds for most questions. If the question specifically asks you, oh, uh, how many centimeters does this plant grow per day? Of course you're not going to use seconds. Okay, so that's delta V over delta T which is equal to average acceleration. And if you rearrange that, you get the change in velocity is equal to the average acceleration times the amount of time elapsed. What happens if the acceleration is not constant? Well, okay guys, we hit the gas for say four seconds, and then we stop hitting the gas and just coast at a constant velocity for four more seconds. Uh, guys, the area underneath the line here is your change in velocity up to some given time, like say eight seconds. How do we know this? Well, for one second at 10 meters per second squared acceleration, we get 1 times 10. Hey, that's a rectangle. We get 10 meters per second. For 2 seconds, we get 20 meters per second. 3 seconds, same thing. So it's the area underneath, and if this is a curve, then it's still the area underneath. Uh, there's a problem, though. We can work out the acceleration from the velocity. Can we do the reverse? Well, if we decide to try the reverse, Hey, what was our initial velocity? So were we starting from a stop or were we already moving and then just speeding up or slowing down? Well, that's a bit of a problem. Of course, uh, that starts to get into derivatives and integrals and other fun things of calculus. Acceleration is a derivative of the velocity. The velocity is a derivative of the position time. Okay, what is the acceleration of the object in figure one? Consider the motion between zero seconds and six seconds. 
Well, in figure one, that was the same. So we went from V initial of 0 to V final of 60 in 6 seconds. So let's start with the formula. You should always start doing a problem with the formula or formulas that you're going to use. So here we have V final minus V initial over delta t, which is t final minus t initial. And this would be 60 meters per second minus 0 meters per second. If you are not quite comfortable yet, you can put the units in as well to make sure that you didn't say copy any numbers wrong. And this is over 6 minus 0 seconds, which gives us 10 meters per second squared. You will find that some steps can be omitted, such as six, equals 60 over 6. Yeah, um, guys, we know what that is. In this case, when you're just subtracting zeros, yeah, you can omit that. But if you actually have calculations here, like 60 minus 10, it is better to write the actual result and then simplify. Now, in this case, we can't exactly give a direction, can we? Well, actually, it uh, depends. In some places, you wouldn't write this, but in this case, let's put positive. Whether you write positive or just positive direction is... Okay. Now, in this example, we're dealing with a squash ball. It has an initial velocity of 10 meters per second west. We hit it with a racket, and we change the velocity to 15 meters per second east in 0 0.2 seconds. What is the squash ball's average acceleration? Well, we have a nice convenient graph here for us if we feel like graphing it. So 10 and 15. Well, we have five grids up here for positive east, and we have five grids for negative east. Let's not use too many. So, if we want that 0 0.2 seconds to be from 0 to 0 0.2, this is probably going to end up being a pretty squish diagram. And we're going to end up with something that looks like this. Zero point two four six eight. Hmm. Let's put our label at zero point five. This is time in second. Now, when you're doing a diagram. Please use a ruler. Unless you're doing a very small sketch on the side to check with yourself, hey, do I have this approximately correct? Please use a ruler unless uh, technical requirements do not allow you, as is the case here. So, what is the squash ball's average acceleration? Well, we know that the formula for average acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. Now this does mean that if you step on the gas and then you hit the brakes so that you go from one red light to the next red light and you stop at both red lights, your average acceleration is zero. However, I do not recommend doing this uh, too much, i.e. stepping on the gas too much, 
because I do not think most police officers are very impressed with, but sir, my average acceleration from over there to here was zero uh, when they're giving you a speeding ticket. So please don't. We are only concerned with the final and initial velocities. What happens in between, well, for all we care, we could go up here and then back down, and we would still end up with the same final and initial, and over final time minus initial time. Which, in this case, is going to be 15 minus negative 10, and this is over 0 0.2 minus 0, which gives us 25 over 0 0.2, and this is 125 meters per second squared. Wait a second. This is a vector, so remember that you should have a direction attached. In this case, we go from negative sum amount meters per second east to positive sum amount meters per second east. And therefore, the direction we're looking at is east. So, take away from this question. When you are asked to do a diagram, please always use a ruler. Always make sure you label your axes if they are not already labeled for you. Uh, also, put scales on your axes.